What role do marketing, advertising, and strategy play in an ever-changing world? In this episode, I'm joined by an entrepreneur, a marketing maverick, and someone whose work has helped to shape marketing as we know it today. Seth Godin is the author of many books, including Lynchpin, Tribes, Purple Cow, The Practice, This Is Marketing, and his latest book, This Is Strategy. We talk about why businesses sometimes think they have a marketing problem when in fact they have a strategy problem. You know, it doesn't matter how fast you're going if you're going in the wrong direction. And companies that think they have a marketing problem think they have to get the word out, they have to hype, they have to hustle, they need to hire a new ad agency. A strategy problem is are you trying to solve the right problem for the right people? A strategy problem is, is the wind at your back or are you fighting the current? Where are the systems and the time? Are you bringing empathy to the table? What game are you playing? I ask him whether he believes marketing is ethical. If Volkswagen was trying to hire a better ad agency when they should have been fixing the way they were dealing with lying about diesel, or when Ford was running around trying to sell SUVs when the SUVs they made weren't very good, ad agencies aren't the solution to that problem. I also ask him how you, as a marketer, a brand leader, someone in a creative industry, someone who is a creator can stop chasing your tail and actually create work that resonates, builds a community, and helps to spread your message. This is The Lead Creative. I'm your host. My name is Monge Zimtati. Welcome to The Lead Creative Podcast where we talk to creative industry leaders, influencers, and brands. We discuss the strategies that influence brand thinking and shape industries. Thought leaders and heads of agencies let us in on some of their thinking and insights. I'm your host, Monge Zimtati. Enjoy the show, and please share and subscribe. Seth, thank you for making the time once again to talk to us on The Lead Creative. One of the things that I really appreciate about your work is that I often get to discover people and ideas that are new to me and people whose ideas, in fact, really matter and are really changing things. So in your current work, what idea or concept has shifted your thinking and how has that idea been playing out in real life? Well, I think the same thing about you. I mean, when we interact, the way you show up in the world, your leadership. So thank you for doing that. I I don't think people realize how hard it is to keep showing up with a podcast and everything else. Um, We can notice things if we choose. And in the new book, This is Strategy, what I'm trying to understand, what I'm trying to decode for people is we can make a change in the world. That there are all these things in the world that aren't working as well as we might like. There are injustices that need to be addressed. There's resources that need to be uh, allocated. How are we going to do that? And so it's not that there are perfect heroes in the world. It's simply that there are people who are doing things that over time make a difference, and we can learn from that. In, the, in this is a strategy, there are quite a number of things that you cover, and I want to go back to that a bit later on in our conversation. In the world today, um, we see a lot of, we talk about a lot of connections digitally, but a lot of these tend to be superficial in many Mm -hmm. ways. How do brands and creators foster truly meaningful communities that are built on trust and loyalty? Well, the hardest part is just saying what you just said, doing it on purpose, doing it with intent. That having someone's email address doesn't mean they're your friend. Following someone on Facebook doesn't mean you have a relationship. We've created all this noise and flurry But relationships are about mutual trust, the Mm. mutual exchange of value, giving other people the benefit of the doubt, offering dignity to people. This is very hard for profit-driven corporations to do because they want to be in charge. And so I think it begins by surrendering 
our desire to be in charge and finding the empathy to understand that other people don't see what we see or want what we want. How then do you drive people towards your profit-driven objective as a brand? I think we can see that in the long run, organizations that build actual communities don't struggle. In the short run, they will never outperform someone who's hustling and shortcutting. Mm. So we have to have intent. Are we here to make a profit on Tuesday? Or are we here to make a difference and build a resilient organization for the long haul? Those are totally different paths, and we get very confused because we think we can easily have both. Mm. Now, with the growth of digital, we are also seeing that people's attention spans keep dwindling. They keep um, getting less and less and lowering over time. What should brands focus on to ensure that they stand out without falling into the trap of the all too common marketing gimmicks that we see out there? So getting the word out and you broadcasting doesn't work anymore. If people are going to know your work, it's because their friends told them, not because you told them. So the way we use social media is not by trying to build a big following for our company, but by giving the people who do follow us tools that give them status and affiliation when they talk about us. That no one's going to talk about you because it's good for you. They're going to talk about you because it's good for them. Now... One of the things that then that we experience, I think, as marketers, as strategists, as creative people, a lot of the time you spoke about being in it for the long haul, doing it over the long term, because the short term or on the short run, the hustle will always outperform the person who's in it for the long haul. How then in this day and age do creators and brands, especially on on digital, create um, meaningful connections where sometimes you don't know in the in the in immediately that you are creating valuable connections. How do you measure these without using without using metrics that don't really matter? Right, you're bringing up a key point here, which is the idea of false proxies. False proxies are easy to measure, but they aren't helpful. So if I want to hire a great programmer knowing how many words per minute she can type doesn't do me any good because there's no correlation between words per minute and programming skill, even if it's easy to measure words per minute. So a key part of our problem is the seduction of false proxies. And, you know, we interview people and we judge them by their charisma or the color of their skin or their height or their gender instead of taking the extra cycles to find out if they can actually join the team that we are trying to build, right? And so getting hooked on social media's false proxies, how many followers Mm -hmm. do you have, that's a trap because more followers does not mean you are more successful. Hmm. Now, as, as, as brands are growing, changing, so are people and people's priorities, And in my view, people's priorities are shifting more towards empathy and purpose rather than the consumer culture that legacy brands of today have built, the ones we celebrate. What opportunities do you think, one, emerging challenger brands um, can utilize as a result of this change? And secondly, how do legacy brands lean more towards these values that humanity is about? Well, let's start with the legacy brands. You know, Procter & Gamble spent $2 billion last year on advertising. Their whole business is based on running mass market commercials to get people to go to mass market stores to buy mass market products. That's not going to disappear, but it's not going to grow. So Mm. they can't easily pivot to the kind of world you're talking about. And I think they know that. On the other hand, challenger brands, which are much leaner and smaller and more nimble, are looking at this world and saying, I don't need the biggest possible audience. 
I need the smallest viable audience. If I can show up for the right people in the right way, they will tell their friends. So we have to bring to the table a resilience and a nimbleness because you can't just go buy a bunch of ads. Is there a way then, if you are a Procter and Gamble, for you to think in the smallest viable um, audience approach? They've been trying. I'm not sure. I don't think that it's going to be easy. And I, if I were on their board, I would encourage them to start a new division with none of the same people in it and just begin from scratch. Because defending your legacy will get in the way of doing the work that needs to be done. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. We're seeing B2B brands. It might just be on my timeline on LinkedIn, but I'm seeing B2B brands become more playful, more creative, more approachable in their approach. I mean, every now and again, you'll see a brand that was all too serious. I think one of the, I mean, one of the things you usually say is no one ever got fired for buying IBM. So you see a brand like an IBM, not them necessarily, being funnier, being more human, being more humorous in their approach to B2B marketing. What does this shift tell us about the future of B2B marketing and what brands are realizing about how they've been doing it? So superficial ad agency humor is not the solution to the problem. If the rest of the organization stays the way it was, you're not going to have what you need. On the other hand, a smart MBA does the math and says, wow, if this customer is paying us $40 a month and they're going to stick around for four years, that's worth a lot. So I engaged with a company yesterday. They have something I'm interested in. I type in my email and a human being emails me within five minutes and we have a call tomorrow. That never would have happened in the old days. That the ability to address actual humans to create the connection, not to say, how do we reduce the cost of this? How do we increase the value of this? Mm. That can lead to humor, but mostly what we want is humanity. And I think that's starting to happen. I'm definitely seeing uh, that happening a lot more. Is it, is it then, is it then going a step further than just listening to the market, just listening to consumers, to showing that you are actually listening in a B2B sense? Listening is very hard. Hmm. Watching is even harder. And what we really need to do is watch. Watch what people are doing, because what people do is what they really believe. So they may tell you they want X, Y, or Z, but if we watch them, we can see how they're spending their time and their money. And we've created this universe where it's easy to watch people now. But many organizations don't have the empathy to watch. They just want to insist. Mm -hmm. In your latest book, which you mentioned uh, when we started, This Is Strategy, which also has a course that I've, that I've been taking actually um, alongside the book itself, you argue that businesses think they have a marketing problem and they try to address a marketing problem when in fact they have a strategy problem. Can you give us a sense of firstly what the book is about and how then how you then diagnose that you have a strategy rather than a marketing problem early before it gets it becomes too expensive yeah great question you know it doesn't matter how fast you're going if you're going in the wrong direction and companies that think they have a marketing problem think they have to get the word out they have to hype they have to hustle they need to hire a new ad agency a strategy problem is are you trying to solve the right problem for the right people a strategy problem is, is the wind at your back or are you fighting the current? Where are the systems and the time? Are you bringing empathy to the table? What game are you playing? These are the things we have to do before we start doing the things that feel like marketing. Mm. So as a strategist myself, I mean, I, I 
engage with quite a number of brands and a lot of the time we work on a, on a brief that they send because to your point they've seen a problem and they've invested time and money into this problem putting out pitches um you know engaging with agencies and then they get to you and you realize it's the wrong problem Correct. that they were trying to solve and invested yes. in how then do you sway a business that has invested, that has gone too far in the wrong direction by the time you, a person who works at an agency, receives this problem. Right. So when you pick your customers, you pick your future. And agencies that wait until they get a broken client with a broken plan are going to spend all their days working with broken clients and broken plans. You don't need that many clients. Go find clients who are willing to have unbroken plans, who are willing to understand strategy. So that means agencies need to go upstream and teach potential clients how to think about strategy. And when you do that, you will find the clients you deserve, right? And so I don't think it's possible when a mid-level marketer sends a medium-sized agency a brief to persuade that mid-level marketer to change their mind. I think we have to go upstream the same way, you know, um, if Volkswagen was trying to hire a better ad agency when they should have been fixing the way they were dealing with lying about diesel, or when Ford was running around trying to sell SUVs when the SUVs they made weren't very good, ad agencies aren't the solution to that problem. You need to work your way up to get the attention of people who can actually see the real problem. Could part of it be an advertising problem, as in, we try we try to fix a, a a systemic and and product problem with more advertising they they thereby creating a bigger problem for ourselves exactly so one way you can tell if a company is in trouble is if when competition shows up they run more ads right and you know when i was at yahoo it was the beginning of the end for them and that's when they started investing in advertising Instead of saying, our strategy is now obsolete, we need a new strategy. In the course, uh, this is strategy, you mentioned, you discuss genre uh, quite mm -hmm. a bit in one, of the, in one of the chapters. How can we use genre to stay focused without becoming too niche or fringe? Well, it, first of all, it's super fun to say genre. Uh, but secondly... Genre is just what do you rhyme with? What section of the bookstore do you belong in? When you introduce yourself, I'm going to make some assertions about who you are and what you do. And if you don't make it easy for me to do that, I will ignore you. So what we have to do is say, I belong in this category. But given that we agree I'm in this category, this is why I'm on the edge of the category. This is why for people in this category, who want this, I'm the only one, right? But first we need a category. This episode is sponsored by the digitally led customer experience agency, Roger Wilco. For all your customer experience, digital marketing and web development needs, go to rogerwilco.co.za or rogerwilco.co.uk. You can also download the South African CX report and the Township CX Report directly from their website, free of charge. Don't we all love something free every now and again, especially with insights, right? Now back to the show. So what, one of the things that I'm experiencing quite a bit, talking to content creators, more developed ones and ones coming into the space, hugely experienced marketers and marketers just starting their journey. There's this, of course, there's always this idea of the niche, the person you're serving there um, and that. And there are two schools of thought here. The one is, of course, go niche, go very um, minimum viable um, audience, go there. That's where you want to go. The other is sometimes if you niche yourself too much, you miss out on the potential audience that you could build. What's, what's the way to go? Some people use the word niching down, Mangisi. Yeah. I think you should say niching up. 
Okay. Uh, I have never met a successful organization that niched too much. That when you are very specific, you put yourself on the hook, and now people you pick better be delighted. If they're not delighted, then your product's no good. It's not that you niched too small. It's that you didn't delight anybody, mm. right? And so if you know a friend of mine is a juggling instructor, and she has a regional niche and a focus. And when people work with her, they're thrilled. She doesn't have to worry about looking for new projects because there's a waiting list. She doesn't need that many clients, right? If she said, I also do fire and I also do tightrope and I also do unicycle and I also do this and I also do this, she'd be a wandering generality. So what I would ask people who worry about niching too small is, how small do you need to be to be indispensable? How small do you need to be to be beloved and trusted? That's how small you should be. Mm-hmm. And just um, finally, are the concepts that is coming out of this strategy, what are the key elements of an elegant strategy? And how can marketers balance simplicity with depth in their approach? Exactly. So an elegant strategy is simple to describe and hard to stick with. An elegant strategy has got the wind at your back. With the minimum amount of effort, you're making the maximum amount of impact. When Google arrived and threatened Yahoo, their strategy was super elegant, which is Yahoo's strategy was come to Yahoo and never leave. They have mail and kids and finance and this and this and this. And Google's strategy was come to Google and leave that their entire model was, we want people to spend as little time as possible on our site. That's an elegant strategy because it matched the ascent of the open web. And they wrote it for years until they switched their strategy again. But the point is, what makes it elegant is it feels like the wind is at your back because you see the systems and you embrace them. I'd like to explore some, uh, a bit of a, a rapid fire round where I give you common challenges that marketers face and you share a specific idea, a blog or a book of yours that provides a solution to that particular problem. I'll do my best. (laughs) Standing out in a crowded market. Right. So that's what Purple Cow is about. And it's not about standing out. It's about being remarkable. Worth making a remark about. You don't stand out with a gimmick. You stand out when other people talk about you. Building engaged customer communities. So some people would like to have a tribe, a group of people that support them. But you're probably not going to have that. What you might find is a tribe that already exists Mm -hmm. and narrate for them, teach them, help them. That is what's possible. And that is from tribes, of course. Creating engaging B2B strategies. Well, you know, in Unleashing the Idea Virus, I wrote about the network effect. And I think Mm. we can agree that just about every modern B2B success story has a network built in. And if you don't build a network in so it works better when I tell my colleagues, it's not going to spread. And that has also become hugely relevant once again today, where people connect a lot more with um, ideas rather than with the gimmicks that sometimes brands and marketers make, um, which to me, I think we've gone, we've almost gone um, to one extreme and we've returned once again. And I think that extreme was when I think social media came onto the scene, it was thought that virality for virality's sake Mm -hmm. was what attracted people, whereas it was what kept people engaged in communities rather than chasing that virality. And I'm seeing today that with the emergence of TikTok, with the latest TikTok dance, with the emergence of the latest trend on X, um, brands are chasing that virality. Why is it that after all this time, marketers and brands are still not convinced that chasing your tail is the wrong way to do it. Because 
marketers are selfish, short-term narcissists who love putting on a show. That's what they signed up for. And it's inherent in the way most people approach it, which is, look at me, I'm doing something cool. So TikTok is just cocaine for those folks because it's this dream that you're going to win the attention lottery. Someone's going to win the attention lottery, but it's probably not going to be you. Hmm. And the last two um, rapid fire ones, um, being culturally relevant. Being culturally relevant. I don't even know how to help someone with that because I think that culture is so broad. Mm. But I think what we want to do, is, and I write about this in This Is Marketing, is find that smallest viable audience. They have a culture. It will be obvious to you. Be relevant to them and ignore everybody else. And the last one, finding your voice as a creative person. This one's close to my heart. Uh, the book, The Practice, is all about this. Um, you find your voice when you trust yourself. You trust yourself to speak up with things that you might be afraid of. You see the resistance and you dance with it. That there is work to be done, there are problems to be solved, and who better than you to begin the process? But you need to practice. You can't wait for mm. perfect. You must begin. How do you know, though, when you're on the right track, Seth? Because, again, when you are building a smallest viable audience and you have niched and all of these things. So I think of, I mean, I think of people, um, people you've spoken to as well, like Srini Rao, uh, Chris Doe, and all these people, right? Like they are very niche in their approach. Yet at the same time, at a global level, um, there are many people who kind of follow their work. But if I'm in Joburg, I want to go to a conference and almost fill a conference, like a, a 50-seater almost, right? Like how then do you create that, that those kinds of relationships, these close linked relationships with your community that you always talk about? So one of my favorite blog posts is called First Ten. There are 10 people who will give you the benefit of the doubt. There are 10 people who will pay attention. Can you bring them something that will cause them to bring one friend each next time? Because now you have 20. And if you can't, you need to do better work. Right? So Starbucks, when it launched, just barely worked. There were only two stores. And they didn't go from two stores to 10,000. They went from two stores to three stores that what we're trying to do is create a red hot center of connection that wants to spread. And that's not easy, but you have to do it wrong before you can do it right. If you're enjoying The Lead Creative, please share this episode with your network and hit follow or subscribe. Enjoy the show. A lot of the time, one of the things that, that we, we find in terms of trying to do it right is we follow best practice. We, mm -hmm. you know, if put this video on YouTube, have X number of shorts, post a short at this time, um, and do that at that particular time. And sometimes these are things, to the point about virali virality earlier, these are things that have worked in the past and might not work today, and we keep chasing the best best practice. How do you know when to ignore best practice and just go on your own path? Yeah, so best practice by definition is about yesterday. So you have to make assertions about tomorrow, right? And if your assertion is every day fewer and fewer people are going to buy books on paper and instead buy books digitally, Embracing the best practices of books on paper isn't going to help you, right? What are your assertions? What are your assertions about what's going to change on YouTube? If nothing's going to change on YouTube, you should keep doing the best practices. If mm. things are going to change, they need to integrate with your assertions. There is, however, I mean, a person like yourself who has always created, in a way, I would say, and I'm, to, I'm referring to your blog now, similarly for years, right, in terms of not following best practice, 
being there all the time, being there every day, um, whether whether the best practice today is long form content, short form content tomorrow, people have shorter attention spans, don't write a thousand word blog post. You keep at it, whether the tides change or not. So in this way, in this sense of things will change or whether things will change or things will remain the same, if you stay on your own path, sometimes you yeah. tend to, yeah, you tend to be on the right side of trends. So it depends on what your goal is. When I saw Twitter, I thought it's going to be really popular. But I don't want to be there. I, that's not my goal. My goal is not to have more readers. I have way fewer readers than I used to. Because Google doesn't send me traffic like it used to. Because I'm not on social media platforms. That's mm. fine with me. If my goal was to have more traffic, I would have to change my content. Yeah. So you got to decide what's coherent. Yeah. I absolutely don't uh, don't see you doing the latest TikTok dance because no. that's what. <laughs> um, Seth, we usually have um, a question that our guest leaves for our next guest. And one of the questions that I thought was really interesting uh, to 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 ask you is by one of our guests who was who is the group CMO of Momentum Metropolitan Holdings. Her name is Nontogozo Matonzela. And the question she left was, is marketing ethical? I love this question. Manipulation is not ethical. Manipulation is using the tools of promotion and marketing to get people to do things they regret. Marketing that is ethical involves telling a story, a true story, that resonates with people and helps them get what they want. Marketing got us the smallpox vaccine. Marketing got us clean water in that village. And marketing got us uh, the ability to fly across the world. Manipulation isn't helpful. Manipulation is not what we ought to be focusing on. But it, if we can build a story that makes things better, I'm in favor. So, so in, in very many ways, marketing can be ethical. It has been in, in, in the course of humanity over time. It continues to be, but it can also be on the other side of, of, right. of those. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is a, ki is a kitchen knife ethical? It depends. If you're cutting carrots, it is. And if you're using it to hurt somebody, it's not. Yeah, yeah. What's the one question that you'd ask our next guest about their work, their creative process, or thoughts about the industry, marketing, or life for that matter? Uh, what systems in the world do you see that most people don't? Systems in what way? In what sense so, of systems? I mean, I talk about systems in, in the book. Gra the solar system is a system. Gravity keeps the Earth rotating around the sun. Mm. The uh, military-industrial complex is a system where countries buy weapons and then need to raise taxes to buy more weapons, and then they have to use them. The educational-industrial complex keeps famous colleges uh, busy and raising their price. The fashion-industrial complex is polluting the whole planet. 8% of our climate problems caused by companies making clothes as fast as they can and people buying them as cheap as they can, you know, denigrating entire communities. There are all these systems around us that self-perpetuate, that change our culture. Some of them are good systems, like public health is a great system, and some of them are negative systems. But if you don't see a system, you can't change the system. Yeah, yeah. And, and lastly, um, if you could ask any living person about their unique take on marketing, creativity, or life, who would that person be? And what is the one question that you would ask them? I'm so fortunate that books and audiobooks exist so I can get that question answered often. Mm, like yeah. my teacher, Pema Chadran, who I've never met, but I did write the foreword for one of her books. Pema is happy to share her answer to that question. Uh, I think I've learned the most from talking to people who aren't particularly well-known, who live in a village or a town, and have 
built a life that they are proud of. And watching what they do, talking to them about how they avoid the short-term hustle, I find that incredibly useful. You mentioned something earlier as a final question about um, listening is hard, watching is even harder. What should we be watching or looking out for as creators, as brands, as marketers in the course of humanity to make our messaging more, to make our messaging resonate more? Well, focus groups don't work unless the person running the focus group is very skilled. But the skill you can learn is to eavesdrop on people and see how they respond to what you made. Go to the store and just sit there and watch people look at the shelf, right? Understand how your employees are working around systems you built to get their job done because the system's broken, right? That being patient and watching it happen is critical. So I wrote this book and I had 300 people take the workshop while I was writing it. So I could watch them respond to the lessons. I didn't ask anybody, is this lesson any good? I watched them respond to the lesson and I took their behavior to make the book better. And incidentally, we've come full circle, I think, to what makes a great strategy because that's it. Um, Really watching people and being able to then um, help them um, do the things they do better. Seth, thank you once again for making the time. Thank Um, you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Lead Creative. Did you get one insight that's worth sharing from this episode? Please share it with your network or your friends. Pop me some of your ideas and innovative finds on Twitter, on at Mongesi. This podcast is available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also find me on mongesi.com.